Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalahungva. The Cleveland Indians are no more. On Friday, the team announced its new name, the Guardians. Since 1915, the team has been known as the Indians, and for decades, Native people have rallied to get them to change the name. The ball club announced the name change on Twitter, ending months of internal discussions. The change was triggered by a national reckoning for institutions and teams to permanently drop logos and names considered racist. The organization spent most of the past year whittling down a list of potential names that was at nearly 1,200 names just a, a month ago. Cynthia Connolly, who is Odawa, is a member of the Lake Erie Native American Council. The council advocated for the name change. Connolly says racist imagery has deep roots and is part of the bias of this nation and native mascots fall into that. This lack of accurate representation actually creates a bias and it leads to you know, negative impacts on our community and people are less likely to support our social justice issues, our real issues like you know, missing and murdered indigenous women and the, the young babies we're finding uh, buried in these residential and boarding schools uh, because they have no concept of who we are as a people today. There is still progress to be made in the state, says Connolly. There are nearly 200 school mascots around Ohio that have Native American references. A state of emergency is in effect for the Hopi people in northern Arizona. Major rainstorms started on Friday and quickly filled up normally dry washes. According to KUII Radio, several families at First Mesa, which is on the east side of the reservation, have been evacuated and more are on standby. The parking lot at First Mesa Elementary School is also flooded. Volunteers came out to fill sandbags for anyone who needs help. The housing area there is also being monitored. An evacuation center is set up at the community building at First Mesa. State Route 87 is closed due to the flooding. This is the main highway from Winslow to Second Mesa. No word on when that road will reopen. And more than 70 miles to the west, cornfields are flooded at the village of Lower Munkapi. Some homes have been breached and the tribe is working with village leaders to see what the families need. Tribal officials are monitoring the villages for mudslides and damages to water lines and roads. Chairman Timothy Navangyoma spoke on Hopi Radio and reminded everyone that Hopi people pray for rain, so the moisture is welcome and needed. Still, the leadership wants to make sure families are safe as the floodwaters rise. The last time there was flooding at this level was in 2010. A new law is expanding dental therapy into tribal lands in the state of Oregon. As part of a project in 2016, dental therapists began working at select tribal and urban Indian health organizations there. The law now allows them to practice in tribal communities and in health settings across the state without a state license. Evidence shows dental therapists have improved oral health outcomes and increased patient care. Nicholas Lewis, who is Lummi, is the vice chairperson of the National Indian Health Board. Lewis says the bill helps tribes take another step towards self-determination. I think with the bill, um, there's still more work to do. Um, you know, as uh, not just Oregon, but other states are, are taking this step, there's going to be a lot more federal conversation. Uh, but this will provide tribal members opportunity to, to be trained and gain the education to serve and take care of their people. In addition to Oregon's pilot sites, dental therapists are currently working in Minnesota, Maine, Idaho, Washington State, and Alaska. The Tokyo Olympics are underway, and this year there are a number of indigenous athletes competing in various events. Jillian Ware, who is Mohawk, is representing her tribe and Team Canada in the hammer throw for the very first time. And two indigenous athletes are representing the United States. Heimana Reynolds, who is Native Hawaiian and Tahitian, is ranked number one in the world. 
Reynolds is competing in park skateboarding. And Micah Christensen, who is also Native Hawaiian, is competing in volleyball. Team New Zealand includes more Indigenous athletes than any team in the history of the Games. There are 33 athletes of Maori descent. The Australian team also breaks the previous record with 16 athletes competing in 11 sports. Among those is NBA star Patty Mills, who is of Torres Strait and Aboriginal heritage. Mills is the first Indigenous person from Australia to carry the flag in the opening ceremony. And in Fairbanks, the World Eskimo Indian Olympics wrapped up on Saturday. There were dozens of competitions, all based in, in cultural needs. In the women's one-hand reach, Eden Hobson took first place. Notice how she has to balance on one hand while reaching to touch the ball with the other hand. She reached 56 inches to take first place. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholohungva. For more than 30 years, Charlene Teeters has been at the forefront, fighting to replace native mascots. We'll talk to her about the latest team changing its name when we come back. Charlene Teeters was a graduate student in the late 1980s at the University of Illinois when she came face to face with the harmful effects of native mascots. Her two young children had powerful reactions when they saw the school's mascot dressed up in mock war paint, feathers and yelling supposed war chants. Teeters is a citizen of the Spokane tribe. That experience led her to a lifetime of working to get rid of native mascots. Chief Eilinawek was her first target. In later years, she led hundreds of rallies to gain support to get rid of native mascots and imagery. In the late 1990s, Teeters was the subject of a documentary, In Whose Honor? It aired nationally on PBS stations. Charlene Teeters joins us now to talk about the Cleveland team name, announcing its name change. Welcome, Charlene. Good morning from Santa Fe. It's been 30 years since you picked up this cause. Um, tell us about the journey. I can't believe it's been 30 years. Um, you know, when I first began to address this issue as a student, I really thought that they just didn't understand. And if I told them they would, you know, they would start to make adjustments. However, um, you know, this has been a long and ongoing journey, you know, which didn't start with me. It actually, be, you know, began uh, decades before me um, at Dartmouth and Stanford where students recognize that these, be, these images actually become kind of a barrier for people seeing us for as contemporary 20, 21st century people. So uh, for me, I also had kind of an awakening realizing that the use of this um, imagery by a mainstream institution like the University of Illinois and or by um, national sports teams that it creates uh, an ignorance in the mainstream America about who we are as real people. If they see us as cartoon caricatures like the Cleveland Indian logo, then they don't see us having real issues, real problems. We are people just like any other people. So it's important that these stereotypes go away like Little Black Sambo and the Frito Bandito and some of those other caricatures that dehumanize a people. It's fascinating how when you read comments, there are, so, there are still those that are holdouts and there always will be. But the vast majority of people are saying, why did this take so long? And I think that is a really important message. I know, um, like I was pretty ignorant when I was a student thinking that they are educated people, they will get it. But there is something about this idea of uh, imaging native people in the past tense um, by this um, use of, of stereotypes that dehumanize um, that there is a connection between all of the other issues that we're dealing with in Indian country that we have the highest teen suicide rates in our communities. That's all uh, connected to um, how we see ourselves and how others see us, that our graves are desecrated, 
that our tribal leaders are not respected. Um, when we uh, pass resolutions that represent the um, duly elected tribal leadership's point of view on an issue like the National Congress of American Indians passed resolutions on this very issue a long time ago um, in the 60s, the first one, that it can be ignored because they don't see our tribal leadership as anything important. You mentioned your uh, first thoughts as a parent, and I also had that experience because my sons played football, and even though their teams weren't associated, every time they played somebody, they got extra attention, and uh, it was awful. Well, what happens when a, a university or an entity has these kind of images, it gives, it, it becomes a platform for people to act out their um, supposed ideas of who they think we are. And a lot of them are very, very negative. Uh, at the University of Illinois, for example, these are educated people, but you know what, the, the environment that we saw when we got there, and I, I say we, because there was three native students recruited there, um, we saw a, a bar in, in campus town that had a neon sign of a falling down drunken Indian over and over again with a broken feather, big, buck teeth and a big nose, big belly, you know, so exaggerated caricature features um, because this is, they don't see us as real. They don't see us as, as having feelings, that we have families, that we have, you know, that we're part of this American, you know, society, you know, so, you know, it becomes a barrier for us to be seen as human uh, so that we can address the very real human issues that face our communities. Speaking of a, a barrier of, against humanity, you had to go through a lot of abuse on this journey uh, at a lot of stadiums and any place where there were fans gathered. Uh, how do you view that now in context? Well, at Cleveland is one of the most, um, you know, um, I wanna say about the local community, very small. The reason that many of them are there is because of the um, relocation program in the 1950s. So these are many generations after that relocation. They're in Cleveland, but they didn't melt into the dominant society. They are still native. They know who they are. They know where they come from. They were out uh, protesting every game, every first game, and they asked for people to come and support them. And um, I always tried to go for the first game in April to stand with these very courageous native community in Cleveland. And it was also there that um, I was arrested um, and kept for 24 hours um, along with other people. So Cleveland is one of those places that was really uh, very hostile towards real native people. As much as they say they love Indians, and that's why we have this image, uh, when real native people are speaking about issues of concern to their community, they don't wanna hear about it. So it was very hostile. Um, and um, we don't believe everybody needs to be a frontline activist, but you know, for me, it became part of how I dealt with this is I became the frontline activist along with these courageous community members uh, so that um, our tribal leaders can deal with this and, and did. I find it extraordinary that in Cleveland's case, and indeed other uh, France sports franchises and universities, they had to invent narratives to go along with all of this. And in Cleveland's case, they had a whole basically fictitious narrative that they tried to sell. Exactly, with Sokoloxis. So, you know, they always say that we're doing this because we're honoring this baseball player, Sokoloxis. Um, and really it's, you know, it's an afterthought usually. And um, the real story is always very telling, you know, because he dealt with severe racism, you know, there in the community as a, as a baseball player, as many of the, those who broke the color barrier, you know, those first, um, you know, um, players, you know, were not treated well, so. 
Do you feel vindicated by what happened last week? Um, you know, I did not think that I would see this in my lifetime. You know, I really thought that this was going to go on for a while because the quality of the discussion and the debate hadn't improved very much. Some of the same things I heard 30 years ago, um, I was still hearing from community members. And, you know, let's face it, we also have Native people who also, um, also embrace these images, wear the cap. Um, you know, so it's, it's a long and ongoing struggle to, to make the connection for people that, you know, we are the best representations of our culture, not these stereotypes that come from pop culture. Do, do you think that Native people ought to be engaged in the what's next, that this is an op a new opportunity to engage with sports franchises? You know, we um, all along would try to engage with the sports um, uh, industry, the um, owners, um, you know, so it is an opportunity um, in the case, and you had mentioned earlier that the Spokane tribe had had a relationship with the Spokane tribe baseball uh, franchise. Um, sometimes good things come out of the struggle. And sometimes, you know, those are some of the uh, variations of the good things that come out of the struggle. So um, in the case of the University of Illinois, we we um, were able to um, develop a, a native studies program out of the struggle. So, you know, in some ways, um, it's important to recognize that those th good things don't come without the struggle. You know, it's interesting when you go back into the history and you look at either Stanford or the one I'm always fascinated by is the Golden State Warriors because they cha didn't change their name but you can't find anything involving native imagery anymore. And the people have forgotten it. I mean, it's completely gone. Yeah, I think that that's a, a good example of, you know, taking away that uh, the negative stereotype of a, a race of people, a people that are born native can't change that. You know, that's the difference between some of these other entities, you know, that are out there that um, they took away those references. And so, it didn't then become that platform for people to put on war paint and do some of the other kind of ridiculous antics that happen at the games. We only have a few seconds left, but I wanna ask you, are you optimistic about the next steps? Absolutely. You know, I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't have a lot of optimism about future leadership, um, that in uh, our native communities, they're finding very creative ways to um, make sure that they see us, we're real, we're still here. Um, and it's important to, to look at our leadership and our young leadership that's coming up. Still here, thank you, Charlene Teeters. Thank you. And we'll be right back. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act turns 50 this year. This legislation created a very different tribal government system for Alaska Natives. There are regional and village corporations in addition to tribal councils. That's just one example of the difference between Alaska Natives and tribes in the lower 48. Megan Sullivan is our special correspondent for our series on ANCSA, and she joins us now to talk about the first stories she's written about for ANCSA. Welcome, Megan. Hi, thanks for having me. In a nutshell, maybe take the big picture and describe the differences with ANCSA. Well, there are many differences with ANCSA, but the one we were just exploring in the identity story is how it factors in to the overall cultural identity of Alaska Natives. Um, and the, the main difference there is that we don't only just have tribes. Um, you can also be enrolled in a regional corporation and a village corporation. So this kind of creates all these different variations um, where, you know, people feel a bit left out if they're not enrolled in a tribe or if they're not enrolled in a corporation. Some people are able to be enrolled in all three. Um, some people aren't any, able to be enrolled in any. So it just kind of complicates the landscape a little bit um, and adds this kind of another system of belonging. 
Well, in fact, you pointed out that some people will actually say, instead of they're from a Yupik community or something, that they're from Doyon. Yeah. So um, some of the sources we interviewed, you know, everyone has different experiences. And that's why in the story, we really wanted to kind of get a wide range of perspectives. Um, but some of the sources we interviewed said that, interestingly enough, they noticed with younger generations, people would say, you know, oh, I'm Doyon, uh, I'm a Doyon shareholder as kind of their identifying factor instead of saying, you know, I'm tribally enrolled in Rampart Village Corporation or in, in Rampart Village. And so you're kind of seeing this, this difference with the new generation. And I think some of that comes from the fact that in Alaska, the, the tribes are tied to the villages. And so if you are from the younger generation and you don't, you didn't grow up in a village, um, then you might feel kind of more comfortable um, saying that you're a shareholder or something like that. But of course, everyone has had a different experience. So this was just an unusual kind of um, new development that some of our sources had noticed with people who are a bit younger. Well, and that's one thing striking in your story is the generational aspect of it. In the lower 48, if you're born in a tribe, you could be born in 1957 or 1977, and it's the same process. Explain the differences in Alaska. Yeah, so that is the the date factor is a huge contentious issue about ANCSA. So if you were born before the 1971 enrollment date, um, you were able to enroll as a shareholder in Alaska Native Corporation. If you were born after, which of course is many people um, within the, the newer generations, you either have to rely on being gifted shares um, or your, your corporation has to have opened enrollment. And so a lot of people were just left out because of an arbitrary date almost, no other reason why, um, which I think is a crazy concept for people who aren't used to hearing about ANCSA because as you mentioned, Mark, that's not the situation with tribes at all, right? A, a date isn't gonna signify anything when it comes to enrollment. And it's a problem people are still dealing with today. Uh, our story that just came out is actually kind of focused on how people feel about the enrollment problems um, and, and how that's impacting them as well as, you know, our next one is gonna be focused on potential solutions. And a lot of these problems, it, they deal with um, kind of concepts that people in the lower 48 are used to too. Um, there's debates in the community right now to open enrollment just in general, but also to people with less blood quantum than one fourth, um, which is the current blood quantum used for ANGSO corporations. And so, you know, people have strong feelings about this. Obviously it's tied to culture, heritage, identity, um, and it's a problem everyone in the community has kind of said, you know, we need to, we need to fix this and find some solutions. Well, it seems like uh, a special challenge is for those who are neither shareholders nor tribal members. How do they come up with identity resolution? Right, um, you know, we spoke to some people who fell into similar categories as that. And even though, you know, everyone would say the corporations themselves wasn't, Weren't, aren't what ties them to their native culture. Um, people are tied to their native culture through other things, but still not having that kind of concrete identifier and solidifier, um, you know, it really made them feel left out and um, definitely complicated their own journey with their indigenous identity. And people can be left out for reasons as simple, you know, they aren't they weren't able to enroll because they weren't gifted the shares, um, and as Mark, I feel like we've talked about this a lot, but as you know, and for our viewers who might not know, people um, are able to get shares who aren't native as well. So it kind of creates even this larger division where um, there are non-native shareholders and then actual Alaska natives aren't even able to enroll. So there's definitely some complications that, that people are still focused on, on finding solutions to. It's definitely kind of an involving piece of legislation, even though it was passed so many years ago. Well, I think one thing that's often missing from the discussion is what was the forces, and your first story kind of got to this, that pushed ANCSA as a reason for being. Definitely, and people have differing opinions on that as well. And if there's one common thread is that people have a lot of different perspectives when it comes to ANCSA, um, but that's definitely a topic we want to explore in future stories. And I think the story speaks to the complexity and the different perspectives that people have had so I'm happy, I'm happy we're being able to use this time to kind of explore the different themes. This one just happened to be about identity, but we have stories coming up 
that look at natural resource extraction, that look at the relationship with subsistence. Um, and we'll have some looking back as well that look at kind of the forces that were at play um, that shaped, that ultimately shaped the legislation and all the impacts it has today. And I think on the other side of the coin, you can say that 50 years later, you still have land, you still have culture. So in some ways you can say that even though it's a different process, it did have a result that was intended. Yeah, and I think that's part of it is that it's been evolving this entire time. Um, and there's so many people in the community that work so hard every day to kind of make these corporations be the best they can be for the community. So whether that be focusing more on culture, um, opening enrollment, you know, making sure the land stays um, intact. And so, yeah, I, I think it's definitely a different um, type of setup, but we hope you guys are all reading about it because, you know, there's a lot to discuss when it comes to ANCSA and there's a lot of kind of complexity complexities involved with it. Megan Sullivan, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thanks for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.